Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we will be exploring Satan, Lucifer, Prometheus, and the Jungian shadow. With me is my old friend James P. Driscoll, who is one of the foremost literary critics of Renaissance literature from a Jungian perspective. He is the author of The Unfolding God of Jung and Milton, Identity in Shakespearean Drama, and Shakespeare and Jung, The God in Time. Once again, this is an internet interview, and I'll switch over to the internet video now. Welcome, Jim. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. It's been a while since our previous interview. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey, and uh, I'm glad to be back. Today we're going to talk about Satan, and I guess uh, you could consider Satan as a theological figure and, and wonder what is Satan's role in the heavenly hierarchy, or you might consider Satan a psychological figure, perhaps part of the Jungian shadow. Let, let me start with the psychological figure first. Uh, Satan is a, a, a part of an archetype, and an archetype is a general thing. It's kind of a, a, a psychic force or a center or direction of our field of energy. And Typically, an archetype can have a whole array of images. For example, the mother archetype could be Mother Mary, it could be a hundred, Venus, a hundred other things. Uh, and that's true with, with uh, uh, Satan. Uh, Satan is connected with the shadow, uh, but there are three major figures in, in, in the West uh, during culture uh, which partake of this area. Satan is one, Lucifer is another, and, and my view is that Prometheus is a third. And they represent different aspects of uh, uh, th this uh, uh, archetype. Uh, Satan is the most negative aspect. He's totally evil. Uh, Lucifer, you go more into the middle. He is, after all, the light bringer, and he's a rebel. He has certain positive uh, characteristics that phase over into Prometheus, who is more of a positive uh, uh, rebel against uh, the deity, a bringer of fire to man, uh, a spur of creativity. So you have kind of a range there between Satan at one end and uh, Prometheus at the other. And the common element of all three is that they are rebelling against the ruling deity. Yes, and Satan is rebelling in a very negative way. Uh, Prometheus is rebelling in a, a, a very positive way. Now, they both manifest the, the, the shadow. And uh, those who uh, in your audience who are familiar with Jungian terminology would know that the shadow, uh, it, they, basically the Jungian uh, structure of the psyche is you have an ego, you have a shadow. Uh, these are fundamental uh, uh, archetypes within the psyche, fundamental functions of of the psyche, but uh, you also have an anima and an animus, and the anima is the a, a, a feminine spirit e essentially, and uh, the animus is the masculine version, or or actually the, the, the usually the anima is connected with soul and the animus with with spirit. So you have those uh, the, those uh, uh, forces. And then you also have basically the kind of a primitive parent force, the mother-father uh, that's there. And, uh, the, but the shadow is opposed to, to, to the ego. It's all encompassed within the self, uh, which is a regulating mechanism of the entire psyche. And these other archetypes just regulate parts of the psyche. Uh, now, of course, Satan as a, and Lucifer and Prometheus, I, I said, are associated with the shadow. And in fact, if you look at 
in, in theological terms, they become the shadow of God, with Christ being uh, uh, the uh, uh, co- correlating to the ego of God. Um, the father is more of a basic uh, uh, um, parent figure that uh, it evolves in an, e- in an interesting way. Uh, in the Old Testament, in the first maybe half of the Old Testament, up, up until the book of Job, the father is a rather unconscious uh, being that Jung describes in detail in his uh, answer to Job, uh, given to a rational outburst, uh, not very developed uh, in terms of conscious control of um, the psyche, uh, kind of like a, a desert cheek or a tyrant or something like, like this. And he does strange things that are irrational and strange. He's vindictive uh, and so on. And that's what, what you get pretty much uh, through the book of, of Job. And you sees the book of Job as uh, a, a, a recting point, sort of, where God changes. And other Jungians follow the, the same thing, uh, and they, they've gone more into the latter part of the, of the uh, Old Testament, where you begin with Second Isaiah, the Psalms, the Proverbs, and so on, and you get a more benign deity. Uh, in uh uh, I'm not sure whether it's the last half, the last third, w- w- whatever, but, but there's a, a, a big change there. And then <clears throat> that um, benevolence or be- be- um, benignity, <laughs> uh, struggling with the pronunciation there, uh, that's developed further in the Christian conception and in subsequent Judaic conceptions also where you have God is essentially a benevolent figure uh, 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 in Christianity. God embodies love and uh, to, uh, truth, uh, too. And so uh, uh, you get a kind of maturation of uh, uh, the, the deity through the development of uh, uh, from the Old Testament on in through the Christian period. My belief is that this continues on after uh, the the Christian period that is going on today, and that it went on it underwent big changes in the Renaissance with uh, her, with Hermet- Hermeticism and uh, uh, Giordano Bruni, uh, Leonardo, Shakespeare. Th- these people uh, we don't consider them part. Generally, uh, Christians and Jews don't consider them part of 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 of, of the sacred canon. Uh, psychologically, I think they should be. Uh, I suspect Jung might agree that they should be as, as well. Uh, so there's this development of, of, de- of deity, there's this complexity, uh, a complex of archetypes within the psyche, and Lucifer, Satan, uh, Prometheus, the shadow, are uh, one of the absolutely key archetypes, and there's a kind of dynamism between a struggle going on between the ego and the shadow all the time within uh, uh, the, the the divine psyche, but within all of our own psyches. And uh, uh, we all have shadows, and some people's shadows could be identified with Satan. Uh, Others could be identified with Prometheus. They could be more of a positive, a positive dialogue with, uh, w- w- with the ego. Uh, so far we've been talking, Jim, about the role of, of Satan as a psychological archetype for individuals and also as a theological concept. But could you say that you see the satanic archetype, so to speak, or the shadow archetype operating at the level of society and not just the individual. Uh, Yes, I think that's true, Jeffrey. uh, Society itself has kind of a collective psyche that's not well understood or well recognized, um, but very powerful because we see these forces, these crowd psychologies sweeping uh, groups of people and even civilizations and taking taking over not entirely the always resistant individuals but uh, it will come to dominate 
a whole uh, way of thinking in, in a nation, society, or even a civilization. The phenomenon of, of Hitler is a good example of how an evil force, I would say identified with, with, with Satan, uh, not really with, not Prometheus or, or even Lucifer, but a satanic force uh, uh, gathered together the collective energy or much of the collective energy of the German nation and uh, was able to, to dominate the whole society uh, and uh, at that time, and it didn't dominate all of civilization, but there was a battle set, set up almost between good and evil or between, uh, you might say, the ego of the Western civilization, which represents the, the past values and and the, the, the dark shadow uh, uh, figures like uh, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill would, would represent the, the ego of Western civilization and Hitler and Mussolini would represent uh, the shadow. So you, you have that happening there. That's a clear instance. Uh, you have things like that going on which aren't as definite uh, or polarized as that became all the time, actually. Uh, you have the dynamics of, of ego, ego and shadow uh, going on. How exactly does Jung define the shadow? It's a dynamic realm of the psyche, uh, ruled uh, by uh, an archetype, which he calls the shadow. Uh, it consists of the energies that are difficult for the ego to, uh, to accept or develop, and they're relegated to, to, to the unconscious. Uh, it contrasts with the, the contrasexual anima animus, uh, because the shadow is the same sex as the ego. It's, uh, that it ties you into the hostile brother's archetype, whereas the anima is the opposite sex. Uh, uh, or in, in, in women, the women have an animus. It's the opposite sex, too. Uh, as I said, uh, it incorporates the Promethean, Luciferian protest and anger uh, uh, along with, uh, uh, it's a source of rage at injustice and intolerable situations. It has a lot of energy that can be put to a good use if the ego knows how how to do that. Uh, and uh, it's identified by Jung heavily. There's, he's, he's written a lot about Mercurius. Uh, and, uh, and the trickster. And that's an, an aspect of the shadow, too. It's not exactly an aspect of uh, Satan, but to some degree it's an, ax an aspect of, uh, of uh, Mercurius, uh, or I should say Prometheus. Uh, the ego identifies or, or engages the shadow in dialectic. That's uh, something that you stresses, and it that ties into what he calls the coincidentia oppositorum, uh, this struggle between opposites that, uh, in, in a kind of dialectic that moves everything forward. Uh, and so, if to understand the coincidentia oppositorum, uh, uh, there are opposites, but you have to remember coincidentia. Coincidentia means coming together of the opposites, a kind of synthesis of the opposites. So the opposites are constellated like ego and shadow, but then uh, in the psychic growth of individu individuation, they become, uh, uh, move into a kind of synthesis, which uh, represents an advance in knowledge or a kind of growth. Uh, Sometimes the, uh, the repressed shadow can break from its cell, prison cell, and it can take possession of the ego, uh, and sometimes even in an outright satanic form, as we had again in, in Hitler. Now, psychologists have to deal with this a, a, a lot, uh, and so you, there's a, uh, quite a bit uh, in you about that. Uh, there's also an, an interesting uh, 
uh, Neumann aspect uh, of it. Well, uh, one of Jung's most illustrious followers, Eric uh, Neumann, who wrote uh, The Origins of History of Co- and History of Consciousness and The Great Mother, uh, also wrote a book called Depth Psychology and the New Ethic. And he talks about a new ethic which could probably be identified with the ego of the civilization. And there's the old ethic, uh, which um, really is uh, more like the superego, but there's also the ethic of rebellion. And uh, that's more associated with the shadow. Uh, so you have, uh, uh, there's a lot of correlates to, to these basic concepts. That's one of the, I suppose, fascinations of the Jungian system is that there's so many interrelations and connections, so many parallels that, that can be drawn, so many uh, distinctions. It's uh, uh, vastly complex and yet uh, uh, meaningful. It's not that hard to, to find, find the meanings and the correlations if you work with it, whereas some other systems of, uh, of I don't know if you call it a psychology or mythical system, the Hindu system, for example, it's much more difficult to, to, uh, to make sense of it, uh, for me at least, and for a lot of Westerners. Well, let's for a moment compare the Jungian notion of the shadow with uh, the way Freud might approach it. As I understand it from Freud's book, uh, Civilization and Its Discontents, uh, this I think the Jungian shadow would be an expression of uh, the impulses of the id, meaning aggressive impulses and sexual impulses, which are natural to any uh, mammalian creature. Uh, But those things are frowned upon by our civilization, and therefore they become repressed, mostly because of uh, the societal superego. That's... Uh, c- correct. The, the shadow is connected with the id, uh, and I think you himself makes that, that correlation. Uh, it, it's also, uh, uh, Jung doesn't deal much with the super ego, and that is sort of transformed. It, you're moving more into Eric Neumann there, who works on the super ego, though he talks about the cultural canon, and that's in Jung too. Uh, but to a degree, the cultural canon, uh, what society wants us to believe and do and say and expects of us, uh, that's in the realm of, of the superego. And, of course, uh, the, the id or the shadow is a shadow to that as well as to the ego. Although... Uh, the sh- the uh, the shadow can take over the uh, super ego, uh, I think, and I think that's at least implicit in Jung. Although I don't think Freud considers that, but uh, a system like uh, actually Nazism or um, Stalinist communism could be an instance of where the shadow takes over the superego, and it rules, uh, it, it becomes, uh, it determines the contents and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, the rules and so on of the superego imposed both by society and incorporated within the individuals of society. That they, uh, it's, they, they will, for example, have guilt uh, for breaking the rules of Nazism or communism. Uh, that may seem strange to us because we think of their rules as immoral, uh, but that's the way uh, it would operate in those systems wh- where the systems are strong. Since you've already mentioned that the uh, shadow archetype is also associated <coughs> with the trickster and that the uh, satanic archetype can sort of take over either the ego or the superego. I suppose it's the case, really, that the shadow can disguise itself as any other archetype. So I often hear 
for example, from viewers who complain that maybe we're doing an interview on reincarnation or spiritualism or uh, some area where people believe they're contacting spirits and they often write in and say, don't you realize these are demons? They're disguising themselves as angels or as past lives or as uh, spirits of the dead, but they're really demons trying to deceive you. Uh, that's true. The, the shadow can, in effect, take over uh, the ego. It can take over... Uh, um, it usually in, uh, resides, at least, in the id. Although I wouldn't say that, that the id is necessarily evil. I, it's, it's a source of energy uh, which the uh, psyche needs. Uh, and it can take over the anima or the, or the enema. Or, or, or the animus, uh, or it can take over the father-mother figure. Uh, the one thing it can't take over is the self, meaning the overriding regulatory uh, force of uh, uh, the, the psyche, although the, uh, uh, the ego has to listen to uh, the psyche. Because the ego makes, or the self makes makes the decisions. So, uh, <clears throat> if the if the shadow or the Satan figure takes over, it can either take over the ego directly, or it could take over the anima or animus and have them take over uh, the, the the ego or the parent figure. It can either do it directly or or, or indirectly. There is a sense in which these various Jungian archetypes are like, I'll say they're like quarks in, in, in the sense that they're invisible. No, we can't see them. We can't touch them. We can't measure them. Uh, we don't know that they are really distinct, precise complexes within the psyche, uh, other than that's how they are postulated to be theoretically by the Jungians. Well, uh, I think of them as like energy fields. Uh, like ma magnetism, for example, uh, if you look at the solar system, we have uh, the gravitational field, for example, of the sun, and various electrical and magnetic fields, but competing with those, you have the plants. And uh, uh, that's kind of what it's like. Uh, the, uh, in, in a way, the self is like the solar system, the, 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 uh, or the psyche is the the self is the most powerful thing, the central controlling thing over everything, but that doesn't mean uh, that there's nothing else going on. Uh, it's an overriding th thing, but within the Jupiter's gravitational field, for example, Jupiter controls its moons, and we control uh, Earth controls our moons. That, that's kind of how it works. It's, it's kind of an uh, energy field, the, the, the archetypes are. Well, and, and as a matter of fact, I suppose it's fair to say that going back to ancient realms of astrology, that we, we develop many of our archetypes out of the astrological images. That's true. Uh, and the, the astrological images were initially gods. And uh, it's hard to draw a distinction between a god and an archetype. <laughs> really, uh, although gods tend to partake of different archetypes, uh, and humans tend to assume that a god is uh, something outside the psyche that is uh, not the same as an archetype, it's an independent force way out there, uh, but that's prob problematic. Or, uh, on the other hand, people with an atheistic orientation will say, well, if it's and not out there, it's not real. And you would say, that's absurd. Uh, things in psyche, in the psyche, are just as real as uh, the tree I'm looking at out, out, out the window there. Uh, Jung even went further than that. He said that there are things uh, that exist in the collective unconscious that are shared by all uh, people. Uh, yes, uh, the most basic archetypes are shared by all people. Uh, the idea of the shadow, the anima, and animus. Uh, Satan wouldn't be, is, is a cultural thing. Uh, 
It's something in the West uh, and and is in the Islamic world as well, but it's something within the realm of monotheism, uh, which would include Zoroastrian and uh, uh, Zoroastrianism that had these two uh, opposing forces modeled on essentially the Hostile Brothers archetype. But uh, the idea of Satan, I, I don't think it really exists in classical Buddhism, but there is a shadow there. Uh, the, the, uh, the shadow in Buddhism sort of pulls you down to earthly thing, uh, uh, obsessions with, with suffering and appetite, and, and this sort of, so, sort of thing. So the most basic archetypes, the ego and the shadow, they're there in Buddhism just as they are in uh, uh, Christianity, Ju- Judaism, and Islam. It, it seems to me that uh, there is an interesting parallel between uh, Buddhism and Christianity in the sense that when uh, both Jesus and Buddha, when they uh, experienced, as I recall, a period of 40 days of intense meditation out Buddha under the Bodhi tree and Jesus, as I recall, out in the desert, they were both tempted by a satanic figure. Uh, yes, and it was both a, a kind of uh, a key stage. Uh, it's initiation, really, is what was happening in both of those cases. And it was a, uh, uh, the, the ego goes through various stages of initiation, which are kind of literalized in more primitive societies that they have special rights and so on, and a boy becomes a man. And the Jews have their bar mitzvahs. Uh, And so uh, 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 that was what was going on there. And it is usually a confrontation with some sort of shadow figure. Uh, In the case of... uh, It's very interesting in the case of... uh, of, of Christ, what was really going on there, because it was an important event, but it's not telling, we, we don't really know very much about it, other than that he was tempted in certain specific ways. Uh, and Milton tried to get into this with a book called, uh, his famous poem, Paradise Regained, which is all about uh, the temptation uh, of Christ in the wilderness. And that was the way Milton saw the, uh, the, the whole of, uh, of, of the Christian myth, as he saw that as a totally key part, uh, whereas some other views would, rep, uh, would focus on the crucifixion and the resurrection. Milton, of course, doesn't deny this, but he sees the actual victory over Satan, uh, as not the, the resurrection so much as it is his uh, battle with Satan in the 40 days in the desert where he uh, resists all the attempts of uh, the tempter to get him to forsake uh, the, uh, God the Father and uh, follow uh, Satan into uh, basically what Satan is offering is mastery of the world. You know, everything that every politician wants. Or, but isn't you know, that a theme you find almost in all cultures, that the world itself is evil, and if you pursue mastery of the world, money, power, status, sex, uh, all of those things uh, can be given to you, but you'll sell your soul to the devil in obtaining them? Isn't that a, a very common theme? It's a very common theme. It's a pervasive theme, I would say. Although, uh, I think if you look at it, at, as Jung looked at it, and a lot of the great people looked at it, they wouldn't say that the world is evil. They would say putting the world first and making it the most important thing ab- above God ab- or uh, above the, the, the self, uh, above the truth, above the principles of truth and love, these sorts of things, just pull, putting the sensuous gratification especially power. Now, the quest for power in itself, in, mo- in you, most religious systems, most sensible uh, philosophers, I think, is evil because it does wind up destroying people. If that's what they put above all else, 
power, then they will do anything to anyone else or themselves in order to gain more and more power. And they will in the end destroy other people and themselves. This is what happened to Hitler. Well, Alfred Adler was the uh, great psychologist who developed a, a model of uh, the human being in which the drive to power was central, uh, even more important than the drive for sexual fulfillment that Freud emphasized. And as I recall, later in his career, Paul, uh, Adler uh, determined that there was an even more powerful drive he called the will to altruism. Well, that's interesting because uh, there's also... Uh, Nietzsche, the will to power. And Nietzsche picks this up from Schopenhauer. And there are precedents to Schopenhauer, too. Uh, so it, it's a, this is not just Adler. This is a very important strain in modern thought. And uh, it's also important in that it recognizes the key role of, of power. Uh, I mean, maybe the three key factors are truth, love, and power that we, that we deal with. Uh, and in order to achieve love or to pursue truth, we have to have a certain amount of power. We can't be totally powerless, but power must be always put in the service of higher ideals. That's, that's the key. And I think that's what Adler is saying about altruism when power is put in the service of altruism, it, the altruism becomes, uh, incorporates the power. It gets the power. Now, one of the most familiar examples is that people become more powerfully motivated in saving other people frequently, saving their country, saving uh, uh, a group, their family, what, whatever, then they would be in saving just themselves. And th this is altruism, of course, but it's power uh, put in the service of alt altruism. Uh, that the same thing goes with, with truth. I think scientists, philosophers, and so on, if they uh, really get focused on pursuing a truth, as probably uh, Einstein and Darwin and, and uh, uh, Newton and many, many others are, then that they, that's where they put their power, and it becomes, uh, it's not a quest for power, but it's power mastered and put in the service of the truth, or as we talked previously, in the service of love. So that's what you want to do. You want to take power and put it in the service of one of those two uh, goods. Now, what Satan represents is taking power and putting it in the service purely of gaining more power and protecting power. Forget the good, forget the truth. He's the, the master of lies. Uh, and uh, just power for its own sake. So you, you have a, a kind of good and evil there. Power for its own sake or power put in the service of truth and love. That would be a psychological interpretation. But we also encounter Satan. In, in fact, I think most people who would even mention the name Satan would think of it in theological rather than psychological terms. I think Christianity has trouble really defining the role of, of Satan. Uh, it's sort of like, if you look at the different Christian writers, including those in the Bible, of course, uh, they vary in their interest in Satan and the degree to which they, they would emphasize him uh, as a figure. And, and Christ himself, uh, he talks ab about Beelzebub, and I think maybe he mentions Belial and Mammon. And, uh, uh, of course, Mammon is a bit different from, from Satan. It's Mammon is greed. Uh, Beelzebub is the lord of the flies. I don't remember exactly what, uh, how he would be distinguished from from uh, Satan, but uh, Milton sees these all as separate figures with different personalities in in uh, Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained. Uh, they're they're not just aspects of, of Satan; they're colleagues of of, of Satan. Uh, so it, but it's a 
confused figure. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, uh, the great theologians of Christianity really spend a lot of time trying to define in, in detail what Satan is or what he represents, and uh, they don't get into Belial or Belial's above. It's sort of on the periphery. Of, of It's part of Christianity, but it is more on the periphery than Jesus and God and Yahweh and for the Catholics, Mary and uh, so on. I mean, that's that's my way of uh, but theologically, it's sometimes referred to, and maybe you can identify the various strains and threads of this notion, that uh, there are two great armies having a, a, a battle in, in the other realm, the, uh, the army of uh, the heavenly host and the angels and the army of the demonic uh, forces. You, you even find it in Hinduism and in, in Buddhism, the demons and the deities, uh, the uh, that there yeah, is war and, and the human psyche is the battlefield. Uh, that's very true, and uh, uh, you get this in John Bunyan, for for example. It's it's very much in in, in the Buddhist. Uh, Milton Sor basically begins Paradise Lost, jumping back to this battle uh, in which Satan was thrown from heaven. And first you really see him, he's uh, landed in hell and says, uh, uh, be better to rule in hell than serve in heaven. Uh, and uh, yeah, th this, this battle it, it is, a, is a big uh, uh, concept that uh, uh, I think it's pretty universal. Uh, I'm not that familiar with American Indian uh, uh, myths, but I do know, for example, uh, right up not that far north of us, the myths around Crater Lake was there was a battle between these two forces, and and the result of Crater Lake, this giant mountain blowing its top and creating the largest crater in the world, uh, it was the that was what happened at the end of the battle. So I think the evil demon was thrown into the, into the lake when the mountain blew up in the, the wizard island in the in the lake is his head uh, according to the native uh, uh, mythology if i remember it uh, correctly now that those tribes of course were uh, what uh, 10,000 15,000 years separated from the uh, 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 mesopotamia and the, the indus valley in, in india uh, no communications, uh, so it would indicate it's it's a pretty universal uh, concept, but it, it reflects to the battles that go on within the human psyche, between the ego and uh, the shadow, and uh, also between the ego and the anima or animus, and uh, the the fundamental conflicts of human life. So what you're suggesting then is is that. Uh, much of theology is really a projection of the psyche. Yes. Uh, you would basically believe that everything is a projection of the psyche. Uh, I mean, everything in terms of our thought processes, our, our whole conceptual structures, and uh, um, it's the microcosm and the macrocosm, and one mir mirrors the other. And we have to have a psyche that... Uh, is similar, well, the psyche as it developed through e evolution, developed through hundreds of millions of years of uh, interaction with the world outside. And so naturally it, it does reflect that. Uh, and of course there are always battles in the world out, outside. We see animals fighting each other. Uh, we see uh, uh, forces of nature that seem to be in conflict. Uh, conflict is an essential part of human life. I have heard some theologians put it this way. They say that uh, Satan obviously must have been created by God, and God is good. Therefore, no matter how evil Satan appears to be, he can't really be evil. Satan is ultimately serving God's will. That's a position that... Uh, 
I think Jung would take. I think it's a, a sensible position. Uh, you didn't believe, uh, and I think Nietzsche didn't believe, and I don't believe in metaphysical evil, meaning that there's a force there of evil that is absolutely equal to God, and who knows my, who, which might win uh, in the end. I think that you and uh, others, including me, would prefer to look at uh, God as God and not having uh, you know another force that's contending uh, there. The point I was making is, is that no matter how evil Satan might seem to be, he's really serving God's will. He can't do any other than serve God's will. Uh, in fact, sometimes Satan is referred to as the accuser, as if that's uh, like the devil's advocate in the uh, Catholic uh, canonization process. It's, it's an essential function. There's a concept of Ouroboric evil. And the Ouroboros uh, represents for you, uh, it's the great round, uh, it's the original primitive state from which consciousness emerges. It's the snake biting its tail, uh, which contrasts, of course, with the yin and the yang, where there's two forces and they're more balanced and complementary. And it's uh, the way I see it, it represents uh, uh, the yin and the yang represent, or the Tao, interdependence. And the kind of dialogue, it's, it's something alive. Whereas uh, the Oroboros represents self-containment. And it's a kind of withdrawal from God's universe. Uh, kind of like a black hole, uh, you might say, a spiritual black hole. And uh, Milton talks about that, how e evil will in the end withdraw from God's world and into a little space of its own and be self-fed and self-consumed. It's a picture of the uh, uh, Ouroboros. And I think that that's a correct Jungian view of, of evil, simply withdrawal from the God's world into something that's self-fed, self-consumed, and not something that challenge, that's capable of challenging God, but it's always there as a temptation for the human beings, for, for creatures, to withdraw into themselves and become self-fed and self-consumed. Uh, 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 self uh, Iago, the devil figure in uh, Shakespeare, says at the end, I, I will uh, speak no more. He simply withdraws from everything. And... Uh, th that's uh, uh, that's uh, I think uh, uh, the correct view of, of this philosophical or solution this philosophical problem now Satan doesn't really represent that uh, it's something different uh, or maybe not Satan but this whole uh, shadow archetype uh, it's something that has to be processed and transformed into good. Uh, it's not a withdrawal into self-containment. Jim Driscoll, thank you once again for a fascinating and enlightening conversation. It's been a pleasure to be with you, and as always, diving into the uh, Jungian view of, of the mind is an enriching experience. Uh, thank you very much, Jeffrey, and any of your audience who wants to look at more of uh, the, the ideas I've been discussing here and elsewhere with you, you might want to pick up my, my new book, which is called uh, Shakespeare and Jung, The God in Time. And it does deal with uh, the, the things we've been discussing. There's a section at the, at the end of a very lengthy glossary, which deals with all the different Jungian terms uh, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, can clarify uh, and answer a lot of questions for people who have uh, want to know exactly what uh, there's even an item on, on Lucifer, what the shadow is, all that sort of thing, uh, and how it fix, fits in the whole system. Mm -hmm.